In this material, we're going to make a lot of use of Racket. Why? Well, we're going to do two things. We'll be looking at existing languages and we'll also be creating new ones. That is, there's understanding and there's building. It turns out Racket is particularly good for both of these. Now, you may have seen Racket before if you're used to a textbook like How to Design Programs. If so, be aware that you're going to see an extremely different face of Racket now and don't get too complacent. Here, for instance, is the kind of program you may have written before in one of the student languages. The very fact that there are student languages should give you pause. How many languages are there? In fact, there are many, many, many more. And that's what we're going to exploit. Here, we see a very similar looking program, but if you look carefully at the top, you see the line hashlang racket. That tells Dr. Racket that this program is in racket. I know you're wondering, well, what else could it be in? Let's see. Here's a similar program, except it's in a language called typed racket. And if you look closely, you might want to pause the video for a moment, you'll see that it has various type annotations in it. Unlike racket, this language runs a type checker on the program and warns you about type errors. Here's another program in a language called Datalog. Datalog is a logic-based database query language. As you can see here, the syntax doesn't look anything like that of traditional Racket. Not everything is parenthetical. The parentheses go in conventional places. There are commas, periods, and whatnot. Datalog also behaves in a somewhat unusual way. Finally, here's an even odder one, a language called Scribble. Scribble is a language for generating documents, so the programs look like conventional markup, but with a full-blown programming language underneath. In short, what you're hopefully realizing is that the term racket actually represents two things. It's a particular programming language with parenthetical syntax, functions, classes, and various advanced features, something comparable to Java or Python, for instance. But it is also an ecosystem for languages, providing the machinery to create lots of other programming languages. Some of these may be very close in syntax and behavior to Racket, such as the student languages or typed Racket, but others can be extremely far in terms of both syntax and behavior. And Racket provides great facilities for building them. So that's where we're going to use Racket. Recall that we said that to study languages, we will both be understanding and building them. To understand them, we want to exploit as many different languages as possible. However, each language has its own syntax, IDE, and tools, all of which take a while to learn and may also contain lots of things that are outside our focus. Therefore, we're going to exploit the essence of several languages which have been implemented for you within Racket. The other part of studying languages is to build new ones. Here again, we're going to exploit some of the features that Racket provides for this purpose. All that said, this isn't a course about Racket. There are many, many parts of Racket that we will not touch upon at all. Racket as a vehicle for understanding may have exploited several of these features, but they're under the surface hidden from you. Racket as a vehicle for building them requires you to learn a little, but we've kept the feature set as small as possible to avoid getting into the weeds of Racket. Still, hopefully this process will help you understand a little about the language and might spark your interest in it and in other language building frameworks.